Hello, people of the internet. My name is Johnny, and welcome back to another Five Nights at Freddy's Theory video. Before we begin, boom! Spoiler warning straight off the bat. If you have not seen my playthrough of Five Nights at Freddy's VR Help Wanted, I highly recommend you go watch that before you watch this video, so then you can understand everything I'm going to talk about in this video. I'll leave an i card up in the right hand corner of the screen, and it'll be linked down below. Go check it out. Come back to this video after you watched it, and now, let's theorize. Before we begin, please keep in mind that this video is simply just a theory video, so not everything I say is going to be considered fact, but I will call out anything that I mention that doesn't have a set answer. I will say, this is just my guess, or this is just speculation, or that's just a theory. A, a game theory. And before we can do that, don't worry, we will get to the story shortly, we just first need to figure out where Help Wanted is placed within the FNAF timeline. Just by looking at the min games, we can see that FNAF 1, 2, 3, 4, and Sister Location are all present within Help Wanted, which means, at the very least, Help Wanted takes place after the events of Sister Location. But there actually is evidence that it takes place after Freddy Fazbear's Pizzeria Simulator, or FNAF 6. In the nightmare version of Fun with Plush Baby, the Plush Baby's appearance actually changes that to resemble Scrap Baby, which is one of the main characters in Pizza Sim. So based on that, we now know that Help Wanted takes place, at the very least, after FNAF 6. And determining if it comes after Custom Night, can be a bit tricky, but there is evidence. At no point throughout Help Wanted, not once, do we ever see or hear of Golden Freddy. And there's actually a pretty simple answer to that. The reason why we don't see her is because she's too busy torturing William Afton in Custom Night. If you guys do not remember exactly what happened, let me explain. After the events of FNAF 6, where everything burns, William Afton is condemned to hell by Henry and Golden Freddy, where he is then tortured for the rest of eternity by all the FNAF characters. So Golden Freddy's absence in Help Wanted must mean that she is too busy torturing Afton in Custom Night. So based on that, I think it's pretty safe to say that Help Wanted is taking place either during the events of Custom Night or immediately after. And now with that out of the way, we can finally start to piece together the timeline of events in FNAF VR Help Wanted. It all starts when Fazbear Entertainment realizes that people are growing suspicious of their pizzerias due to events such as the Five Missing Children incident. An indie video game developer, maybe Scott Cawthon, but his name is never mentioned, though we do see his face during the introduction of Help Wanted, makes things worse by creating games that make the pizzerias a place for murders and turns the animatronics into vicious killing machines. This ends up making people even more suspicious of Fazbear Entertainment. After nearly going bankrupt because nobody was going to their pizzerias, Fazbear Entertainment searched to find a company to work with to wipe their slate clean and create a game to act as though the games made by the indie game developer were just made for fun, and that there was nothing wrong with the company. At the start of Help Wanted during the introduction, Hand Unit explains exactly that. ...that Fazbear Entertainment has developed something of a bad reputation over the last few decades. And while it's true that some stories associated with our name were loosely based on actual events, the majority of them were total fabrications from the mind of a complete lunatic. Lawsuits pending. But we aren't above laughing at ourselves. Ha ha ha. That's why we have recreated many of these completely fictitious scenarios, lies, that you've been fed over the last several years into a hilarious VR game, in the hopes that we can finally move past these childish ghost stories and develop a new relationship with you, as well as your kids. Don't forget the merch perfect for birthdays, so sit back and enjoy a few scares. There's even a chance that when you die in a minigame, there will be text put in place by Fazbear Entertainment on the monitor claiming that all of these minigames are, quote, completely fictitious scenarios. And other noteworthy lines can appear on the monitors such as animatronics can't kill you and nothing can harm you. 
It can even be suggested that Fazbear Entertainment was taken to court previously, as one message says, nothing was ever proven in a court of law. The company that Fazbear Entertainment finds to help create what will eventually be called the Freddy Fazbear Virtual Experience. Welcome to the Freddy Fazbear Virtual Experience. The Silver Parasol Games. This is the company that many of the characters in the tapes work for. Tape Girl, Jeremy, and Dale all work at Silver Parasol Games. Like I said before, Fazbear Entertainment is about to go bankrupt, so to speed up the development process of the VR game, they send Silver Parasol Games small plastic chips with data in them. These chips can be used to create the minigames we play in much faster. Doors have been emptied out. Someone was here. I don't think it was spring cleaning either. No. There was plastic on the floor. Someone was definitely here during the night. It had to have been the client. I mean, they sent us that stuff in the first place with no explanation, told us to scan it, said it would expedite the process so we wouldn't need to program any pathfinding ourselves. It was a budget thing, I guess. It was just junk. Circuit boards and things like that. Looked pretty old. Somehow, though, there was usable code on some of it. It seemed to take hold by itself. Things started changing. But they come with a cost. What nobody knew is that these chips contained a secret virus. This virus would later become known as Glitch Trap. But then, he started appearing. I think it's pretty safe to say that Glitch Trap is, in fact, William Afton. But since he should be in the little embodiment of hell that is Ultimate Custom Night, it's hard to say what this version of Afton, this character, is. My guess is that some parts of Afton were left on the chips that were given to Silver Parasol Games, and some parts of Afton now exist within the VR game, though that is just speculation. And now, good old Jeremy finally comes into play, as Tape Girl mentions, But then... He started appearing. At least that's what Jeremy said. Jeremy is the tester for the VR game. He's also the first person ever to notice Glitch Trap, as stated in Tape Girl's previous message. Jeremy, now aware of how much a threat Glitch Trap could be to the project, warns Dale, the boss at Silver Parasol Games, about Glitch Trap, but Dale doesn't listen. He forces Jeremy to continue testing the game, and as he does so, it seems like Jeremy slowly is being driven into insanity. Tape Girl describes walking into the studio early one morning and finding Jeremy talking to someone while he's wearing the headset. I came in early that morning. No one else was there. At least that's what I thought. The supply room was lit. I didn't even notice Jeremy standing in the testing room as I walked past. The supply room was so bright glowing from all the way down the hall. This someone is obviously glitch trap, and after a few more days of testing, Jeremy is reportedly very pale and is still trying to get Dale to cancel development on the game. Jeremy complained of nightmares when he came in this morning. He wasn't talking about it like someone telling a friend about his dreams, though. He was pale. Looked like he hadn't eaten in days. He spent an hour talking in Dale's office, but it didn't look like he was given much sympathy. It's at this point that it seems that Jeremy has completely lost it. As Tape Girl mentions that Jeremy doesn't get scared by the characters anymore and that he is continuously talking to Glitch Trap. He doesn't even jump anymore. Nothing scares him. He just stands there like he's talking to someone. Sometimes he rocks from side to side. We were told to leave him alone. I knew I was in line to do the testing next. They'd been prepping me for it. I guess they knew that Jeremy would need to be replaced soon. After an undetermined amount of time passes by, Tape Girl walks into work early yet again and finds what she describes as a Halloween mask lying in what is apparently a puddle of ink. There was something that looked like a Halloween mask laying on the floor. I didn't understand. Ink must have spilled. It was only then that I heard a shuffle from the testing room and realized Jeremy must be there. I went back and peered in the window. I couldn't see his face. He had the visor covering his head. He had ink spilled on himself as well. The front of his shirt looked black in the dark room. He turned his head in my direction, but I don't think he knew I was there. Now I'm gonna go out on a limb here and say that that's not ink. 
my guess is that it's blood. One tape that seems to go off topic might actually hold the answer as to why Jeremy is bleeding. In one of her tapes, Tape Girl mentions a guillotine paper slicer. Have you ever heard of a guillotine paper slicer? It sounds made up, but it's an actual piece of office equipment. I didn't even know we had one in the supply room. I guess they're more common at businesses that do a lot of graphic design work. I remember seeing one when I was still in school, and even then, I knew how dangerous it looked. I was always afraid of losing a finger. That seems so silly now. Jeremy used to do design work. I guess that's how he knew it was there. Based on this tape that comes out of basically nowhere, I think Glitchtrap persuaded Jeremy to injure himself using the paper cutter. And we know that Glitchtrap can alter the way people think because Hand Unit outright tells us exactly that during the introduction sequence. You acknowledge that Fazbear Entertainment is not responsible for accidental digital consciousness transfers. Dale then finally does something once he realizes what is happening to Jeremy, but because he can't just randomly fire him, Dale starts to come up with false reasons to fire him. You can always tell when a company is getting ready to fire someone. They start giving out written warnings for silly things, making sure to build a paper trail and make a case for a firing. Things that normally no one would care about suddenly become grave offenses, all worthy of being written and documented. I guess it works two ways, because it also encourages a person to quit rather than be scrutinized so heavily. I think Jeremy was too far gone to consider that option, though. The thing about it is that I don't think they were going to fire him because of anything he was doing wrong. They just knew he'd seen something. They needed to discredit him. Tapego explains that because Glitchtrap is slowly taking control of Jeremy, his mind, and his actions, that he's too far gone to quit by himself. What happens next is possibly one of the biggest turning points in the game. Tape Girl describes hearing Dale on the phone with someone talking about a lawsuit that Silver Parasol Games has been charged with. I heard a pretty heated conversation this morning between Dale, our manager, and someone else on the line. It really feels like this project is in trouble, in no small part because of the lawsuit, I'm sure. There has to be a lawsuit, there's no way there isn't. It happened in this building just a few doors down from me. I think it's made worse by the fact that Jeremy tried to tell us something was wrong. But as a dev team, we all just saw it as a challenge to find what the problem was and fix it. Who could have known that? I have to go. Well, it's never told outright what the lawsuit is about. My guess is that Jeremy was driven into madness by Glitchtrap and killed himself to stop the merging process of him and Glitchtrap. This is backed up by a few key points. The lawsuit could have been filed by Jeremy's family for the death of him under the company's eye, and the quote from scottgames.com, Remember Jeremy, could be referencing his death and or what he had warned the company about before he died. But the evidence that I find supports this theory the most is the fact that Glitchtrap is still in the VR game when we play it. If Jeremy hadn't have ended the merging process by killing himself, Glitchtrap would have succeeded in merging with Jeremy and therefore would have escaped the game. With the lawsuit now in place and the recent death of Jeremy, Silver Parasol Games have had enough with the VR game and want to get rid of it. Silver Parasol Games find a company that will continue developing the game, but to make sure that it looks like nothing is wrong, Silver Parasol Games make Tape Gold test the game for the last three days that they have it before they sell it to the other company. I was told I had three days to finish Jeremy's work, but I know it's just passing the time. They don't really expect me to do anything. It's just to keep up appearances until the buyout is complete. We have to look like we have things under control. There's another potential development studio that wants to pick up from here, but who knows what kind of lies they're being fed to convince them to do it. Against my better judgment, I'm going to do my best to see what's here, make notes of it, and try to isolate where this thing is hiding. At least then, the next person that tests this will have a chance of getting rid of it. During her testing, Tape Girl finds hidden messages that were sent between Fazbear Entertainment and the indie game developer. They lied to us. They lied to all of us. They told us that the whole point of this VR game was to undo the bad PR done by a rogue indie game developer who supposedly made up a bunch of crazy stories that tarnished the brand. But that's not true at all. 
In their haste to develop this VR game and clear their name, they sent us some things I don't think they intended us to see, such as a hard drive containing emails between Fazbear Entertainment and a certain indie developer. Fazbear Entertainment hired the game developer. Those indie games were designed to conceal and make light of what happened. This isn't just an attempt to rebrand. It's an elaborate cover-up, a campaign to discredit everything. It's revealed that Fazbear Entertainment hired the game developer to cover up what happened at the pizzerias. And as mentioned at the start of the video, people grew suspicious of the locations because of these games, which led the company to fire the game developer and move on to work with Silver Parasol Games to discredit the games made by the indie developer. It's while she's playing FNAF 1 that Tape Girl first notices Glitch Trap. I saw it for the first time today. There was a character, I couldn't make out who it was, standing at the end of the hall. I thought it was just bugged out, so I made a note of it and kept playing. But then it was looking in the window, and not like Chica or Bonnie would. It was like it was actually looking in the window, seeing what I was doing. She realizes that this is the thing that led Jeremy to kill himself, so she creates a tape for the next company that is working on the VR game to find, so that they could get rid of Glitchtrap before the game is released to the public. Can you hear me? Don't exit this room, okay? This isn't a mistake. This room isn't a mistake. I had to hide these logs away from the core gameplay files in a place that only a beta tester would look and in a place where the files could be protected. I just really, really hope that the next development team finds this before the game is released to the public. This game has some kind of malicious code in it that we haven't been able to fully contain or even understand for that matter. We're over budget and out of time. Because Dale is still making sure that the game is ready for the next company, Tape Girl has to make the file size for the tape small enough so that Dale doesn't notice it. Listen, I have to keep this short so the file size will be small enough to fly under the radar. There are more. They may not be in order. Making the file size for the log small is both good and bad. Good, because then Dale won't notice the tape at all, but bad, because it's so hidden that nobody would ever think to check there. And Glitchtrap knows this, and uses it to his advantage. He attaches himself onto the tape, so that he too can go undetected. Today was my last day of beta testing, and the anomaly that I've been seeing is nowhere to be found. But after inspecting some of the files, it seems that it's attached itself to these logs. My logs. That can't be an accident. Because of this, Tape Girl had the idea to delete the log. Since Glitchtrap is now attached to the log, deleting it would delete him too. At least that's what she thought. Unfortunately for her, she made the file size for the log so small that even she can't find where it's located. I can't delete them. By creating a protected area to store these logs apart from the game, I effectively gave this thing a safe place to hide itself. It's in here now. I may not be able to delete it, but I might be able to do something else now that it's attached itself. I have an idea. I ran a fragmentation program on the area of memory that was storing these logs for you. I effectively broke the files into pieces and broke the anomaly along with it. That means that you won't have my warnings to guide you, but hopefully it also means that this anomaly this virus, or whatever it is, will remain broken and unable to do more damage. She breaks the log into 16 different pieces, so that now Glitchtrap is a lot weaker than when all of him was attached to just one file. The game then gets sent to the new company, and Tape Girl thinks that everything and everyone is safe from Glitchtrap now. But of course, here comes us. A tester for this new company, and what do we do? We find the tapes and put them back together, something Tape Girl tells us straight up not to do. I created a series of logs for you documenting the troubled development of this VR game that you're now testing, in hopes that you, whoever you are, and whatever team you are with, will abandon development. Now I fear that those logs are being used as a Trojan horse. If you are unable to abandon development, Hide all traces of these logs that I've created. I fear that finding them and reassembling them will also reassemble the very thing I've tried so desperately to destroy. As we collect all the tapes, Glitchtrap goes stronger, 
more visible and moves closer to us. Until eventually we've collected all the tapes and he's now strong enough to merge with us. Blitztrap stands on center stage ready to fuse, reaches out his hand, and within the next few seconds, we're standing in his place. Looking at our hands, we now realize that we have taken on the body of Glitztrap, which means he has successfully merged with us. In this ending, Glitztrap wins. He possesses us and is now free to escape the game. But luckily, Tape Girl leaves us a hint on how to defeat him. There is a way to kill it. It wants to escape. To escape through someone. Someone plugged into this game. That's you now. You have to let it begin the process of leaving through you. Then use the disconnect switch that I've embedded by the main stage. Let it approach you. Let it begin to merge with you. Play the music and flip the switch. That will cause a hard restart of the game and flush the memory, effectively killing it. I hope. I don't know when it will come for you. If you, while Glitztrap is possessing you, hit the Showtime button, switch the Nightmare Mode switch, and then hit the button on the side of the monitor, you'll get teleported to a secret room with a locked door in front of you. If you interact with the door, Glitztrap emerges from the other side, shushes you, and then retreats into the darkness. Now I'll be honest, I have no idea what this ending is supposed to mean. The only thing I can notice is that on Glitztrap's side of the door, the wall has the classic white and black checkerboard pattern, and on our side, we have scratch marks and maybe even blood on the door. But what happens after the ending is what we're interested in the most. In place of Glitztrap is a plush version of him. Something that my brother seems to be very excited about, strangely. No! Yes! No! Buddy! <laughs> I'm about to... My warped out buddy. <laughs> I love you! <laughs> my guess is that, in this ending, we are the ones that come out victorious, and we reduce Glitztrap's energy and spirit into nothing more than a harmless, powerless, because I have a feeling people are going to ask for my opinion on it, I believe the pizza party ending is Glitztrap celebrating his success of stuffing you into a Freddy Fazbear suit. Remember, Glitztrap is some version of William Afton, you know, Kitty Strangler. He lures you, a seven-year-old kid based on the number of candles on the cake, behind the stage with cake and pizza, dismantles Freddy, as we can see his remains between Chica and Bonnie, and then stuffs you into a suit and forces you to perform on stage. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, Fazbear Entertainment would like you to put your hands together for the one, the only, the only, 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 only. I guess if you really wanted to go deep, we could assume that we play as Gabriel, the name of the kid who was actually stuffed into the Freddy suit based on the FNAF 6 and FNAF 3 endings. Glitztrap also could have used Gabriel's young age to his advantage, as the line from Pizza Party, Find Me, could be a reference that Glitztrap was pretending to play hide-and-seek with Gabriel as a way to lure him to the stage. Glitztrap is truly dead? No. Not at all. I'm sure Steelwool and Scott have future plans for him, but for right now, it's up to the player what ultimately happens to Glitztrap. And that's it. That is the entire story of Five Nights at Freddy's VR Help Wanted. Hopefully I covered everything, but this is a very big and complex game, so if I didn't, I'm really sorry. Feel free to leave your theories and opinions on this video in the comment section down below. But thank you everyone so much for watching, and I will see you all on the flip side. Goodbye!